All right, everybody. Well, welcome and uh, to the VA lecture series hosted by Dr. Ayler. And uh, today we'll be talking about um, HIV long-term prognosis, uh, optimistic outcomes. Um, it's very exciting in the world of HIV that before we were worried about keeping people alive, but now we're actually looking towards long-term, if not normal lifespans with controlled uh, antiretroviral therapy. So. I wanted to go into kind of the latest thinking about HIV and long-term prognosis and um, get some thoughts what people are, are uh, considering and also future research directions. So the session aims, sure, is to talk about a few uh, couple important points. First, I wanted to go over the concept of immune reconstitution and what the impact is on HIV morbidity and mortality. Um, the immune system obviously is a very, very large component of um, HIV and also of aging, and it's important to understand how HIV and aging are similar and not similar to understand how HIV patients are different from non-HIV patients uh, in the aging process. The second aim is factors for successful HIV antiretroviral therapy. So which patients are normally more successful with ART and which ones are not? And the third aim is chronic versus recent HIV infection. So are our HIV positive patients who are diagnosed in the 80s and 90s any different biologically or in terms of outcomes from recently infected HIV individuals? And what differences are those in the generations for us to expect long-term um, mortality for these individuals? Aging and HIV. What is the natural history of aging HIV versus acceleration that would be expected, and how does ART modify that? And uncommon illnesses or morbidities, morbidities that we see in HIV, different than a non-HIV uh, population. And the second is future directions in HIV. What are people now looking at? So we've had a lot of growth in ART uh, development, so what are now researchers working on in HIV? And then uh, future community infectious disease threats. So generally speaking, now that HIV thankfully has become more of a controlled disease, what are the future directions in infectious diseases that could present a problem in the future? So speaking about immune reconstitution, this, is, I'm sure you recognize, is a very familiar HIV-1 virion. Um, to think about immune reconstitution, you have to think of what is irritating, if you will, the immune system and what the immune system is, is uh, picking up on or identifying. Um, you'll see the GP120. Um, it's about the 11 to 12 o'clock section of the virion. Um, that's a very important uh, marker to keep in mind. Same with GP41, um, also in about the 11 to 10 o'clock area on the virion. Uh, that's important, as you know, both in diagnosis of HIV, when we do a Western blot for confirmation, and also for um, therapies uh, to target the virion as well, um, as those are important um, docking areas. And I wanted to go over first the immune constitution. Um, you remember there are two types of HIV-1 viruses, the CXCR4 and the CCR5 virus. Um, as you know, to give a, a medicine called Maraviroc, you have to check the um, type of HIV virus that it is. And I wanted to show you that the HIV just does not affect the T cells. It affects the primary lymphocytes and the monocyte macrophages. So we normally think of HIV with T cells, but it also is affecting other cell lines. So HIV in the immune system, um, I know the fellows are very familiar with this, but I wanted to put this in for the students and the folks working, uh, watching at home on the podcasts. Um, HIV in the immune system, this is a very, very nice graphic from the um, NIH here. Um, you'll see the stages, um, the fusion of the HIV in the host cell, you'll see approximately at 10 o'clock on the graph. Um, and then you see the second stage is when the HIV virion um, actually release its, its um, RNA into the cell. And it also it comes prepackaged with reverse transcriptase and integrase. And so once the package, if you will, is inserted into the cell, it releases uh, the viral RNA and the reverse transcriptase and starts its work, right, moving the RNA into DNA. And for the students, that's why it's called reverse transcriptase, because normally in the body, DNA goes to RNA, but it's a retrovirus, meaning it goes kind of in a backwards way, so it goes from RNA to DNA. So once the integrase is working into the um, 
sorry, once the viral DNA is formed, it actually incorporates into the host DNA. And this is something very interesting and problematic, but also an area of research with HIV. Because HIV incorporates into the host DNA, it creates reservoirs. So HIV can, quote, hide in different aspects of the body, brain, lymphatics, etc. So this is unlike the hepatitis C virus, which does not incorporate into the host DNA. It will go into the liver cells, but it can be functionally cured. Uh, currently, HIV cannot be functionally cured, because, uh, of course, in some exceptions we will talk about, but generally speaking, difficult to functionally cure because it incorporates itself into the host DNA. You'll see next it goes into the new viral RNA, and the new viral RNA then, um, as it is converted back, um, becomes a budding virion and then becomes a mature virion. So we'll see in the development of antiretroviral therapy, the drugs were developed um, to interfere <clears throat> in the key steps of the HIV replication process. The first one you'll be familiar with are the fru fusion inhibitors, brand name Fusion, that actually helps um, um, the, it helps stop the fusion of the virus to the cell. You're for most familiar with the <clears throat> NNRTIs, and NRTI stands for non-nucleus reverse transcriptase inhibitors and uh, nucleo uh, uh, receptor, uh, sorry, transcriptase inhibitors. And um, you have the integrase inhibitors, um, our friend raltagravir, dalutegravir, um, protease inhibitors, um, darunavir, atizanavir, um, so, and maturation inhibitors. So we have a whole host of um, medicines that can interfere with these stages. Um, HIV evades the immune system and establishes latency, as we notice, but I wanted to show you the exact places where it uh, does establish latency. Um, the brain and the peripheral blood, certainly, but also the gastrointestinal cells. We see more evidence now um, that HIV does have latency in the GI system, and this puts uh, HIV-positive patients more at risk for GI-related malignancies. Um, lymph nodes, certainly, in the rendo uh, reticular endothelial system, so higher risks of uh, lymphoma as well, and the bone marrow as well. Some of you might have um, heard about the um, Timothy Brown patient. Are you familiar with Timothy Brown? So he developed a malignancy, and he was given two stem cell transplants. And so we think the reason why he had a functional cure was that his bone marrow was ablated, and so all of his reservoirs essentially were cleared from the HIV virus. Right, right. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I heard about that, but I, the last IDSA meeting, I think, I'm sorry? Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the HIV, I think, is still considered um, not resurgent. So HIV progression without ART, as you know, devastates the T cells, but also it um, devastates the humoral response. Um, so it affects both lines of the immune system. So what about HIV non-progressors? Um, in terms of the immune system, right? What does this mean? So HIV non-progressors, it's defined as HIV-confirmed individuals who maintain very low or undetectable HIV viral loads who do not undergo dramatic decrease of CD4 cells as other infected individuals. This is approximately 5 to 15 percent of HIV-positive individuals globally. You've also heard this as long-term survivors. Elite controllers, however, are a subset with consistently undetectable viral loads without any antiretroviral therapy, and there are only approximately 100 persons worldwide, and many of these have um, very generously given their time and their blood samples to research institutions so we can understand a little bit um, what exactly is happening in these elite controllers. Um, it's a very interesting case from California. We'll go into it. Um, there are two main mechanisms that people think are going on. Um, the first one is the CCR5 delta 32 allele that you saw in the previous slide. Um, homozygous individuals are more resistant to infection. So in the Berlin patient, he was infused with cells from a CCR5 homozygous um, individual, and that was actually done purposely to help give him a better chance of not getting reinfected by any HIV reservoirs. Um, and you'll see heterozygous individuals have been shown to have slower rates of disease progression. Interestingly, um, this is uh, seen more in Caucasian populations thought to be done for an evolutionary reason for resistance to Yersinia pestis and uh, smallpox um, historically. 
Um, the second mechanism, as demonstrated in a California group, um, are there's actually a substance that they're still trying to identify, but uh, they put a CD8 cell um, of the elite controllers in vitro, and the uh, virus actually stopped replicating. It's pretty amazing. And they took out the CD8 cells, and the virus started replicating again. So they've done extensive studies to understand what that substance is, but they're still, they're still trying to, to work on that. Um, immune reconstitution, I just wanted to differentiate for the students what the difference is from immune reconstitution and uh, disordered and ordered immune reconstitution because we see this not only in HIV but other immune suppressing um, conditions such as cancer as we see in Moffitt. So the definition of immune reconstitution is the expected or normal phenomenon of the immune system recovery during antiretroviral initiation um, as HIV patients um, lead to recovery of CD4 cells, right? We also see that when cells come back after a bone marrow transplant um, or chemotherapy. So normally in HIV, we expect immunoconstitution to strengthen the immune system and uh, basically um, reduce the frequency of opportunistic infections and to prolong survival. But you've probably heard of IRIS, which is the immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome. That's a dysregulated immune response, so that is more of a robust response than one would want. And we see this sometimes once uh, ART is initiated. And uh, we will talk about this. Um, but basically, it's a paradoxical worsening of an existing infection or disease process or an appearance of a new infection disease process after the initiation of ART. Um, and as discussed, we can see this in bone marrow transplant, solid organ transplant, and cytoreductive chemotherapy. Um, so IRIS, um, it goes by a couple of names. Um, IRIS is probably the most known. Um, and as you can imagine, you have a sur uh, um, upsurge in biomarkers, um, particularly interferon uh, gamma, tumor necrosis factor alpha, seroactive protein, interleukin 2, um, 6, and 7. Um, the most defined and most common forms of iris are myobacterium tuberculosis and cryptococcal disease. Um, in fact, uh, during the early days of HIV, it became a little bit uh, confusing for providers and healthcare people to understand, is it iris or is it an opportunist infection, that there's actually an international network for the study of HIV-associated iris. So they got together and made guidelines to help understand if it's immune resurgence or is it opportunistic infection. So the key definitions of iris, first, the onset of symptoms are after the initiation of ART, does not necessarily have to coexist with a rise in CD4 count, and the timing is variable, and it is pathogen dependent in terms of how robust your iris response will be, and also how easy it is to calm down the immune system thereafter. Second, inflammation is noted clinically or histologically. And the third, you have to rule out any other cause. So you have to rule out non-adherence to therapy, any resistant organisms such as multidrug resistant TB, you have to rule out non-response to ART, and you also have to rule out presence of any other infectious or pathologic processes. There are two main types of iris per the international network. One is called unmasking iris. Um, Essentially what they are is the person with HIV already has an opportunist infection, such as tuberculosis, but they weren't previously suspected. So after um, the immune system is awakened, if you will, uh, the iris is unmasked, meaning it was not apparent before. Um, and you also see this a new onset of cryptococcal meningitis. So someone's already been colonized with cryptococcus, um, they go on ART and suddenly they come in with neck pain and a meningitis picture. Well, did the cryptococcus invade overnight? No, probably not. They probably had it before, and now that the immune system can recognize the antigen, it's mounting a response. So that's unmasking iris. Paradoxical iris is the second type of iris. It's a worsening of previously diagnosed or known opportunistic infection. So a good example you'll see um, is worsening pulmonary infiltrates. Um, if someone has um, tuberculosis and there's a worsening infiltrate, and sometimes clinically you can ask yourself, why are they getting worse if I'm trying to help their immune system? Well, now the cells are activated and the body can mount the response. Um, so that's a paradoxical iris. 
So iris morbidity and mortality, um, how dangerous is it? What pathogens cause it? So the infectious agents that we deal with, as you can imagine, would be tuberculosis, especially in the developing world, but also seen in MAC, um, and, uh, which is a mybacterium avium complex for our students. Um, herpes viruses, CMV, HSV, VCV, fungal infections, and the JC virus, and even hepatitis B and C. Um, and classically musculum contagiosum and HPV. Non-neoplastic entities, which is always important to keep in mind for dimpharyngeal, includes Kaposi's, lymphoma, Graves, rheumatoid arthritis, sarcoidosis, and a xenophilic folliculitis. And you can have more than one. Um, iris also is rare, um, especially in the United States now that we're catching an, um, HIV infection at an earlier stage with higher CD4 counts. Um, it's less common to see, but certainly uh, we do see it. And we think it might be linked to specific um, underlying genetic HLL characteristics of the patient. Risk factor for iris include low CD4 count at initiation of ART, especially CD4 count less than 50. The magnitude of the disease in terms of the burden of opportunity infection present in the body, uh, whether it's miliary or disseminated tuberculosis, specific pathogen, um, and then um, also risk factors in terms of anyone who might be at risk for um, AFB or cryptococcal antigen. Um, if they had it before, they would be at higher risk. So some providers suggest that for newly diagnosed HIV individuals, people screen for cryptococcal antigen or serum AFB. But I don't find that particularly helpful, but certainly in a high endemic area, it, it might be helpful. Um, but sometimes it's helpful to, to screen, um, certainly when there are symptoms, but um, there's no uh, true guidelines to screen before at this time. Um, so for iris morbidity and mortality, um, just to, to wrap up this particular portion, um, is that the treatment is NSAIDs um, and a short course of steroids. Uh, you'll notice that in uh, cancer-related re iris as well. Continue ART and optimize the treatment for the associated condition. And it's low overall mortality. And uh, the trend, um, thankfully, is to initiate ART earlier with a higher CD4 count um, across the, the world internationally now. So hopefully the burden of iris will decrease, um, continue to decrease in the future. So optimizing response to ART, um, and I just wanted to associate, this is a very, very classic graph that we all saw in the beginning of the HIV epidemics, but basically you'll see in the blue um, the primary infection, that's the CD4 count. Um, how it drops initially makes a little bit of a resurgence, and sometimes we actually see patients at, if you can imagine, the top of the hill there, if you will, but then people start plummeting very rapidly. Um, same with the viral load in the red. You'll see a very, very rapid increase in viral load and then a drop, um, and then it will upsurge. The reason why that's important is if you're seeing a patient kind of at 12 weeks, um, one year, um, when their CD4 counts around 600, 700, their viral load is um, about 10 to the 3, et cetera. Sometimes people are hesitant to go on therapy, but you can imagine as a provider, you know what's coming down in a couple of years, so it can, it can certainly accelerate. So just to you know, be able to speak to your patients that, yes, that's, it, it seems like it's plateauing, but unfortunately it does rapidly um, pick up velocity in terms of um, immune destruction down the road. And a lot of people uh, present at, you can see at the nine-year, ten-year mark, um, even or actually at the seven-year mark, but opportunistic diseases come later in HIV, um, but we're trying to obviously diagnose that earlier um, before waiting for people to get an opportunistic infection to be diagnosed. Favorable initiation of uh, ART. So who are good patients, right, who is able to uh, adhere to ART. This is obviously a generalization, uh, but uh, there's a very interesting cohort. It's called the Antiretroviral Therapy Cohort Study Collaboration, the ARTCC. This is actually a U.S. and European cohort of approximately 70,000 HIV-positive individuals, and it's an amalgamation of 19 cohorts. It was begun in 2002. And it actually has patient data from 1995. So this is a good way to answer the question, how are our patients from the earlier days of the HIV epidemic different or similar to the ones that we're seeing now? So they went through all these algorithms. What they found was the favorable indicators are earlier initiation of ART, um, and also initiation of ART when CD cell, uh, TD cells were above 350, and not using intravenous drugs. So intravenous drugs is, of course, a marker for social instability, sometimes mental health problems that aren't being addressed.
um, but that was a very strong signal um, in their analysis. So worse outcomes, um, infectious, uh, sorry, um, intravenous drug users uh, showed actually a two times higher mortality overall, and also more morbidity, especially related to hepatitis, particularly hepatitis C, and drug overdose and mortality. Worse outcomes with low CD4 counts and also um, overall um, social factors. Um, so having a good lifestyle or stable housing actually does, does help, um, as you have seen, I'm sure, in the clinic, but also in terms of policy and government policy. Um, there's more effort now to make sure that HIV-positive people do have stable housing and good mental health care. Um, and tobacco smoking, so the number one non zeta related cancer is now is lung cancer in this cohort. Other factors influencing long-term heart success, we talked about social support, and these are actually now new markers um, in the uh, Ryan White uh, indicators. So um, we're actually working to kind of go to the next level, if you will, in making sure that people are plugged into good social support. Um, so the AIM-3, general HIV outcomes, looking at your cohorts, 1990s versus post-2005. So the overall life expectancy increased actually by 13 years uh, for those uh, starting into retroviral therapy from the 2003 to 05 compared to those 1996 to 99. And this is also from the ARTCC. Um, there has been a 40% decline in mortality between the two groups, and that is huge. That is a big triumph for, I think, the public health infrastructure in terms of um, not only developing the drugs with the basic science infrastructure, but bringing those to uh, patients to take, and uh, we've seen a lot of success. Um, and as you can imagine, starting earlier. Earlier is better. Um, also, the current life expectancy in the U.S. and Canada for HIV-positive individuals is approaching the general population, and this is really a big triumph. Um, current HIV life expectancy also, um, you're probably um, familiar um, with this. This is the um, NA Accord, which is another um, gap, uh, sorry, cohorts called Closing the Gap, um, and it's part of the NIH International Epidemiological Database to evaluate AIDS. And this is 22,000 individuals, and I'll just briefly go through it, but they did about seven years. But I just wanted to show you that a lot of people have been working on this, and this is um, one of the major studies that is followed by um, a lot of the American-based um, policy groups. Um, so just to show you this, um, you can see um, what it's showing for the red line is basically as so you have mortality on the uh, the y-axis and you have age group on the x-axis and what you're seeing is that mortality is decreasing from the red to the blue to the green as the years go on so the red is the 2000 period the dotted blue is about to 2003 and then the the green is about 2007 up to 2007 so we're actually seeing real significant uh, decreases in mortality um, and this is mortality rate per 1,000 person years. Um, we're also seeing a couple of differences, and um, essentially we're seeing that um, here, are the, here are the unweighted mortality rate, but they stratified it into gender, uh, injection drug use, and ethnicity. And what I wanted to show you is the mortality rate here, but also I wanted just to point out the males had a slightly higher mortality than females. Injection drug users, you can see, is up to 34. Um, and then um, non-Caucasian groups also had a higher mortality. And then the CD4 count, um, you can see less, uh, less than 350 was mortality of 23. Um, and that's in rates, so that's per 1,000 person years. But if you start greater than or equal to 350, it's up to 11.3 or down to 11.3 rather. So that's showing real significant differences, not just theoretical, but actually looking at a large cohort of uh, factors that uh, affect mortality in HIV. So this one, um, just to show specifically more, is that um, similar to the graph, but it's just a number. So you can see for men and women um, from 2000 all the way to 2007, you see the life expectancy has increased from 35 all the way to 53, women 36 all the way to uh, 47. Um, in terms of um, total life expectancy, to me those numbers seem a little bit low still, but um, I think those are just those are averages. And then um, this is just another way of looking at it. So you can see um, these are years, and you can see again the IDG group is um, more mortality. Um, the same thing, non-Caucasian groups unfortunately have higher mortalities, and the CD4 count initiated um, greater than 350 is uh, less mortality.
So HIV accelerated aging, how exactly is uh, how is HIV accelerating aging, right? Is it a large acceleration? Is it slower? Is it doesn't make a difference anymore? And which illnesses are most susceptible? And then which morbidities overlap for HIV positive individuals versus those HIV negative individuals? So one of the ways that you can analyze HIV accelerated aging is looking at the VAX index, which is the Veterans Aging Cohort. We're here at the VA, and it's a um, national cohort um, coordinated by Amy Justice um, up in uh, New Haven. And they do a great job bringing all the data from the Veterans Administration to look at how HIV accelerates aging. And as you can imagine, being a VA cohort, um, mostly men, so it's 92% male, uh, most folks Folks have completed high school. There's very rare intravenous drug use, and um, baseline socioeconomic profiles are um, kind of averaged out a little bit. Um, and all of these uh, individuals in the cohort acquired HIV after joining the military. So for that reason, it's an ideal cohort to follow people longitudinally. And they've looked at different indicators. So basically, they were uh, looking at different indicators in their treatment course. And uh, using uh, many algorithms and modeling, they were able to try to make a formula to predict um, aging and accelerated aging and also mortality. So something to um, remember is that aging is a process of chronic inflammation. So not only in normal aging, but also in HIV infection. So when you have telomere shortening, right? Remember from biology, you have the telomeres, and as they shorten, the cell ages. Um, so you have immune activation, immune senescence, and it leads to a common pathway of inflammation and then inflammatory disease, right? So we all learn that cardiac disease is a kind of an inflammatory state. Certainly HIV and treated is an inflammatory state. Um, Altosclerosis etc. So you're kind of having this common pathway between these. Um, and this is interesting because this is um, the pro-inflammatory cytokine release from senescent um, or activated cells, and you see these in both processes. So this is a very good uh, review by Herb Sedal, and it compares HIV-positive individuals um, to the general non-HIV population. And what they did is they actually took um, biomarkers you can see on the left-hand column, and they actually compared which levels um, would be high in each group. And you can see some similarities. I wanted to pr um, point out a couple of important ones. One is HSCRP. That's a measure of um, but basically cardiovascular disease. And you'll see that in both groups. But you'll see on the HIV side, you have a little bit more signals in terms of um, metabolic syndrome and obesity. Um, and also TNF, so a little bit more pronounced in HIV-positive individuals. Um, but again, you'll see a lot of, lot of overlap. And I'm sure, depending on the population sample, you're going to see differences and um, more similarities and also different than this, this table. Here's just another one. Um, just pointing out TNF, and especially, I want to go back um, to the malignancies, which is um, pertinent to uh, Moffitt, but not Hodgkin's lymphoma, as well as higher in HIV positive uh, individuals. And then, uh, area of research now is bone mineral density. So, you probably heard antiretrovirals such as tenofovir can cause um, osteopenia in men. And uh, it's a new kind of movement now to look at bone mineral density among HIV-positive uh, patients. And we might be getting DEXA scans as part of normal care as our patients get older with HIV. And we might be seeing premature uh, fracture risk in our HIV elderly. Um, HIV-specific morbidities. Um, cardiovascular disease has a very strong signal. Um, you have a relative risk of 1.6 if um, your patient is HIV positive. And interestingly, um, there's a relative risk that came up of two if patients were ANIRT, and I think that's just part of the study, and it might be due to the PI drug class. I'm not totally convinced that's the end of the story, but some, some studies do show an increased uh, signal. Um, and the back of your is now, I think, disproven to cause specifically increased CVD, but you'll see that sometimes on board or test questions, but it, I, I think it's been rather disproven now. And as we talked about, uh, you have an odds risk of osteoporosis, 3.7, a reduced bone mineral density of 6. Um, so that's a pretty high odds ratio. Um, so important to, to keep your eye out it. And then Northeast, sometimes it's helpful to check vitamin D levels. Uh, here, most people usually will have okay vitamin D, so just to think about. Um, it, the bone loss frailty can also be due to uh, T cell activation or GP120 or VPR proteins in the virion specifically, but they're still working this up, and this is an active uh, area of research. 
Um, HIV and neurocognitive disorders, uh, this used to be a very um, large concern in HIV and aging. Uh, certainly can be accelerated in severe immunodeficiency, um, but I think we're seeing an optimistic trend where people are starting ART at an earlier stage and we're actually seeing less neurological uh, uh, sequelae from HIV, including HIV-associated neuropathy. So uncommon, um, kind of more for the students, the Kaposi sarcoma. Um, we used to see purple spots essentially on folks and that was sometimes a presenting um, symptom in the early days of the HIV epidemic, especially in San Francisco, people would present with kind of purplish lesions and that would be how people knew that they had HIV. But now it's rare, thank goodness, because the virus is becoming um, identified more early. And um, HAND, you probably heard of this, it's the HIV-associated neurocognitive disorder, also more rare. And this is an interesting area. Um, it's found that you have increased concentrations of Pseudomonas and Candida albicans um, with microbial translocation of the small intestine. So apparently there's new studies uh, working with the HIV microbiome specifically, um, which may or may not be ART related. So future directions on HIV, and I, I wanted to take this directly from the NAID, but this has also been echoed in a lot of the IDSA conferences, but I took it verbatim because I wanted to go over it. So basically, the HIV reservoirs throughout the body uh, is an active area of research because now we can control the virus and suppress the virus with ART, but what about getting a functional cure, right? <laughs> so without getting a bone marrow transplant or using chemotherapy, are there ways that we can intelligently identify by biomarkers where the HIV variants are hiding, right, and try to, try to bring them out, flush them out, if you will, of the reservoirs and to combat them in, in the body. Um, also, another active area of research is trying to figure out which combinations of antiretroviral therapy or new modalities. Um, also, model systems, um, including, you've probably seen a lot of studies in um, non-human primate models to um, look at latency. So these are just kind of the same ideas, um, but these are definitely new active areas of researching. So uh, future, I wanted to go over this very exciting um, trend in HIV vaccines. As you know, there are many attempts for HIV vaccines, and some are more successful than others. But I wanted to bring this to your attention because I thought it was the most successful. It's the RV144. It's a phase three trial. And basically, I thought it was interesting also, it was sponsored by the U.S. Army Surgeon General and conducted with the Thailand Ministry of Public Health, and it was in um, the Rayong and Chonburi provinces of Thailand. It actually took 47 health centers, and they used it a, a prime boost combination. They found it lowered the rate of HIV inf infection by 31.2 percent, um, with a pretty robust p-value. So um, they think that it's mediated by um, immunoglobulin uh, G, so IG antibodies binding to the V2 and V1 region of the HIV envelope protein. Um, so this has given a lot of optimism to the vaccine community. And there's a new vaccine trial being launched called the P5, um, trying to understand what adjuvants work better. And uh, it should uh, begin in South Africa and Thailand in 2016. So um, this just came out uh, in February of NIH. Um, they're finding mechanisms to help evade antibodies. Um, and what the news was about is they're actually trying to stop the conformational change of the GP120. Remember the first slide where we were looking at the GP120? So we're trying to stop the variant actually to bind to the CD4 cell, so you stop the cascade of events that leads to infection and establishment of latency. Uh, this is an excellent um, resource. Um, there's a website called the Body pro.com um, and this is a wonderful poster that was put together by some basic scientists and I've, I've selected a small part of it but essentially what they have done is they've gone through and actually categorized the antibodies and, and where it's acting and what the target is on HIV and these are actually very optimistic because there's a lot of possibilities that um, vaccine developers can target and to try. Um, I was asked uh, by some people to explain PrEP, so I wanted to go over that because sometimes there are a lot of questions on that. Um, what have been uh, the developments in pre-exposure prophylaxis and would that be something that um, the HIV community would um, 
endorse or would that be a good idea? Well, certainly um, in July of 2012, FDA approved tenofovir and tricytamine, uh, brand name Travada, for prevention of HIV transmission. This was particularly seen uh, with men who have sex with men, a 75% risk reduction, so it was very, very helpful. Um, it is prescribed by some physicians, especially um, in kind of more urban areas or if the client is um, very concerned about infection, and certainly it has been done. Um, it's interestingly, um, when it first was approved, we thought a lot of people would be asking for it and using it, and we were worried about perhaps resistance with HIV uh, in the community, but it's, it's apparently not as widely used um, as we originally thought, but um, it is definitely recommended um, among high-risk groups. Um, so just to go over, for those who haven't seen this, and this is for our students, um, I want to just put this in here. Um, so for the NRTIs, you have tenofovir and tricytabine becomes Truvada. Abacavir, lamivudine becomes Epsicom, and Zadavudine, and um, sorry, and lamivudine become Combavir. That was the original combination, and then that's an old drug called Trisavir. We don't use the D drugs again for our students. Those cause extreme liver diseases. So the NNRTIs, of Fabrins, that's our friend Tripla, Repivirine becomes Complera when combined with Truvada, Etravirine, and Nevirapine. Integrase inhibitors, raltegravir, dalutegravir, which is a once a day formulation. And then when you have elvitegravir, it's combined now with cobacistat, which is a boosting medication. And it becomes a brand name stribold when you combine it with um, denofovir and antracitamine. PIs, darunavir, and we use ritonavir as a boosting medication. Again, for our students, ritonavir is a um, PI in and of itself, but it was found during clinical trials that it's a better booster, as in it raises levels of the protease inhibitor without causing additional toxicity. So these are the protease inhibitors, and these are the ones in italics are the ones that we don't use as often, but you'll sometimes see patients on them. The CCR5 antagonist is Maraviroc, and fusion inhibitor is Inveritide or Fusion. So PEP, um, of course, we're familiar with occupational post-exposure, um, but there's been some questions about uh, folks showing up in the ER who've had uh, sexual assault, et cetera. Um, it would be recommended, um, and also recommended in correctional settings and other high-risk areas. And uh, as we know, um, most uh, healthcare settings have a um, strict guidelines for uh, giving post-exposure prophylaxis, which uh, is now recommended through VADA, so it's TDF, FTC, tenofovir, and tricytabine, plus raltegravir. Um, future infectious disease threats. So have you heard of the MERS-CoV? Did you guys hear about that? That was a big uh, thing that came out um, fall of last year, but since then has kind of taken a senescent course. There's always influenza coming out uh, in areas of the world. Um, but what I thought and what I'd like to propose to you is that some of the future infectious disease threats, especially in the United States, are actually the refusal of recommended childhood vaccinations. So in Florida, we've been having problems with pertussis resurgence among our elderly who may or may not be seeing a regular doctor, but as you know, pertussis vaccination and immunity wanes over a period of five to 10 years and may not be effective in everyone. So even if someone's had a vaccine um, with the herd immunity effect, sometimes it's uh, unfortunately easy to spread the disease if adults are not revaccinated. Um, so, and this is kind of future directions um, that we're working with here at USF, um, trying to reduce HIV transmission, especially in the Southeast, and uh, working uh, with HCV and trying to uh, eliminate uh, co-infection and at least uh, begin more widespread treatment of co-infection. So um, this is a graph um, just to show um, a little bit where the HIV infection is now. Um, the HIV infection has kind of uh, changed demographics over the year now. It's mostly in um, male African-American um, patients. And I wanted to show you this also. Um, basically, it's an area of um, new kind of epidemiological focus. Um, HIV in the southeast um, does unfortunately still have some of the highest uh, percentages uh, in the United States um, and different epidemiology, so more uh, sexual transmission in, in the southeast and more intravenous drug use um, in other parts of the country. Um, so just to, uh, again, kind of more for our uh, students, I think our fellows are, are aware, but um, I wanted to share kind of the distribution of HIV. Uh, Florida is extremely high. You'll see Florida and Louisiana 
um, and also New York State. Um, and then HIV in prison and jail. So um, thankfully, uh, we are having um, communication between our clinics and the jails and prisons. We actually have a nurse practitioner um, at the Hillsborough Health County Department that uh, does work on Saturdays and goes into the prison populations and makes sure people are on their meds and kind of becomes a continuity of care provider. But just to remember that folks with HIV, when they go into the prisons, they, they come out again and we have to make sure that they remain on their antiretroviral therapy. Um, as you can see, the ratio of AIDS cases is decreasing, um, specifically because of this work. So so you'll see 4.8 in 1999 and 2.4 in 2007. So definitely improving and definitely there are more widespread um, HIV specific programs in prisons and jails to make sure that people are um, on therapy. And uh, so these were our aims and I'm happy to answer any questions. <laughs>